So um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, all the things I was told to talk to you about. Um, I was told to talk to you about um, our center CI3, and um, we have two people from CI3 in the back there, so uh, say hey. Um, and then I'll uh, talk to you about a specific, I'll give you kind of an overview of CI3, then I'll um, talk specifically about um, a project that we're doing now. Um, and then um, I was told to talk a little bit also about um, my work in the provost's office um, on, um, on diversity and faculty development. So we'll see how much we get to. So I'm trained as an OBGYN, um, and I, like many people, um, you kind of, and I think many of you all in the room, you sort of have a calling in this idea of how can we uh, make an impact um, and, uh, on people and on other people's lives. I specifically, I had actually started in general surgery, um, but the issue of um, adolescent pregnancy um, just seemed so compelling to me that I decided to become an OBGYN and focus on issues of adolescence and, um, and children's gynecology. Um, you know, I think in many, in many ways often we uh, pick our research interests because they um, somehow relate uh, to things that we have thought about. And um, I grew up in a time when uh, teen pregnancy rates had, uh, were, had been declining and there was a lot of, but it had been, there's a lot of public and a lot of uh, information about it in my adolescent years. And so I think it was this topic where I thought, you know, it was such a way in which people's life course and trajectories were, were changed. Um, when you learn about uh, teen pregnancy from the field of obstetrics and gynecology, uh, you then learn about family planning. And so for many years, I've headed the family planning programs. And this is, uh, you know, sort of a, it was very much learning about devices and learning about, this is a pharmacokinetic study that, uh, a graph from a, a study that we ran trying to understand how different uh, body habituses uh, metabolize contraception. Um, but. I pretty quickly learned what I think you all, um, especially the, you all sitting here at SSA, already knew, is that so many of the social determinants um, are what are impeding and changing people's health. And often what, we're, what we do in the clinical setting can't really take into account all of these other social determinants. We try, we add social workers, but um, it, for me it's made me realize that so many of my hypotheses were limited. Um, and the tool set that we were using was limited. And this was, um, I learned this in many ways, but one of the ways that um, I learned it was just in a series of focus groups that I was doing with adolescent girls. I worked with one group of African-American um, adolescents and another um, Latina um, adolescents, and it was about all of the bad things that contraception could do to them and all of their fears and concerns. And so, um, I'd then go back into my clinical world and they'd say, you know, we have to get these methods to adolescents, how um, they, these are the methods they should be using. And that, and so it was really also grappling with that disconnect and the limitations of the resources that we were using. Um, so for me, um, you know, you, this quotation is now quite old. It's, um, and you know, I think one of the signs of uh, a good researcher is you just take the same question and you grapple with it over and over again. And so. You know, I'm someone who's uh, been using some slides and some concepts my whole career. Um, but this is, uh, comes from the New York Times, and it's, um, it's um, about really what I think we under, many of us understand about uh, the city of Chicago, that there are um, separate, uh, that people have very separate existences and uh, that creates inherent um, inequities. And so whether we want to talk about structural inequalities or other factors, it was just, you know, one day reading the New York Times and just seeing how um, someone can kind of go from these sort of structural from transportation to whether you can get to the bank and whether you can get food and how it influences education and then into health care and, um, and uh, having safe places for your kids and how all of these things go together. And so for me, this is a way of just capturing that, that issue. So this is um, where I tell you that I am also a total nerd, and um, this is sort of a map that I then created to start to think about if we were to approach 
health differently. If we were to approach the reproductive health of young people in a different way, who else would I need on this campus? Can we start to think about this campus, and you'll, you'll hear this theme again, but can we think about this campus as sort of a problem-solving network where you brought people together around different problems, and who would, who would be part of that network? And so that was the beginning of thinking about a, what a center would look like called CI3. And you know, we could do adolescent health and who are all the people and some of you will uh, see your uh, you know, faculty that you know. Because that's what I did. I looked on websites, I said, who's here? And I started to map it. This is a conference we held and um, you can see um, uh, again uh, your, your faculty members um, who participated in this. We're now, um, I believe this was 2011, 2012. And this was a meeting of people to say, you know, if we were to start to focus on adolescence in a different way, and we we're going to try to collaborate across disciplines, what would that look like? And so what we did is we held a conference. And I love this picture because it has people from the Urban Education Institute, from the law school, from the medical school, from Chapin Hall, um, coming together to talk about what it would look like to think about adolescent health more across the life course and more in kind of a socio-ecologic model. And at the time, those were the two things that I was thinking about. Um, and then this was, um, at the time, uh, this was uh, the group Arate was really uh, a really great thought partner in sort of thinking about how this would come together. And that was really the beginning of CI3. Um, so flash forward, CI3 is almost uh, five, years, uh, five years old, not quite. Um, yeah, um, and um, I, you can see I'm very good with logos. The name is just abysmal, <laughs> it's, you know, it's really, really long, but I really like the logo, so we stuck with that. Um, but what I learned really quickly is that it's actually very hard for people to work in an interdisciplinary way. Um, I use um, the analogy, and um, I'll often use clinical analogies, because I think it makes sense to people, this idea that not, uh, I, as an OBGYN, I can't solve all physical problems, right? You are more, if you have a heart problem, you are not going to go to your OBGYN. You, your OBGYN might tell you to go see a cardiologist, right? But that what we need to know is enough of the other languages so that we can start to move and refer and begin to collaborate. Similarly, if you're a surgeon, you can't be the only person, you can't say, I'm gonna run everything, right? You have to be able to build collaborative teams. And so when I sort of thought about CI3 and some of the challenges and what it, the kind of the Tower of Babel I had created by bringing all these different disciplines in, um, I began to realize that one of the keys was in collaborating around a project, collaborating around making things. And so one of the core principles we use is this idea of making things. And as a result, we've ended up with three kind of labs where we make stuff. Um, and so I'm going to take you kind of briefly through each of those labs to give you a sense of the type of work that we do. So the first is um, the one that really helped us understand how to develop this and really became the model for the other labs, and that's called the Game Changer Design Lab. And so um, that's directed by Ashlyn in the back. <laughs> um, and. Um, and this is a lab that focuses on designing games and apps. Um, and what is particularly uh, special about this work is that it allows adolescents to be part of the design of the intervention. And you can think about how many things have been sort of designed and not user friendly. Um, you know, it's kind of the, uh, the difference between the plug that goes into your, uh, into your Mac that when you not walk by it, it just doesn't pull your computer off the table versus um, if you sort of think about like your, what it was like your first day walking onto the University of Chicago campus and not knowing where to begin, right? So what's the difference between something that was designed with you in mind and with you at the table? And what it did for us also was it helped us start to understand that young people are authorities on their own lives and what it means to bring that type of authority into, um, into the design of an intervention. And because you're working in games and you're working in things that you really do have a lot of questions about, you're not going to be as presumptuous about it, um, it really helped create kind of a democracy. Um, the second lab is uh, the Design Thinking Lab. And this is really a way, uh, it's a design methodology, but I'll take you through um, one of our projects. 
Um, and um, that's run by Amanda, who uh, you sort of see in the back there. And then the last lab um, works in storytelling and narrative. So um, this, is, uh, this is the Game Changer Design Lab. And we work in board games and digital games and apps. And, uh, and then we also do kind of live, uh, more role-playing uh, role uh, playing games. And so games are really, um, games are not only fun, which is a really important part of why um, we design games, because we really work with young people in kind of this asset-based way. And so we want something that is not negative or shaming and blaming, but something that they actually enjoy doing. But it's also really interactive. And so um, we spend a lot of time planning what we're going to do. Um, and this is work I do with uh, my uh, collaborator in the humanities, Patrick Jagoda. Um, and again, uh, having something concrete like games allowed uh, kind of a humanist and um, a clinician uh, uh, researcher to, to collaborate. Um, and this idea even, um, as you can imagine, in the humanities of working kind of with hypotheses and kind of hypothesis-generated work is, was also like a really difficult place for us to, um, to come to. And so that point of planning um, and this idea of how do you have design actually meet research um, is what we do in that planning uh, moment. And then we bring the adolescents and young people in to the process of helping to iteratively design um, the intervention. And then we go into our research phase um, and, all, and then um, the, the scaling and dissemination phase. So I want to just give you a few, show you a few examples of, um, of what that looks like. So Hexacago is um, a game that, um, that we design, and it's really kind of a board game. And you can see it up in, um, you can see it up in that box there. And so it represents the city of Chicago with sort of the water on one side, the different neighborhoods and the, and the trains. And the idea is that it helps young people or players start to think about um, the city at a systems level. And so, so often when we talk about health and disease, we talk about it at an individual level. What is the decision you made? What was the choice you made? And when this is the outcome, and we have to counsel you so that you change your behavior. But really, so much of what happens has to do with the social and structural determinants. And so we're interested in this idea of what happens if you reveal that, right? If you just sort of show that to people. And so um, one game, for example, is a game called Infection City. And we, look at, um, and we look at the issue of sexually transmitted infections. And instead of just thinking about it as a decision-making process, we actually show them your job is to figure out where the health center should be located and how the location and access to health care actually can determine where you have more spread of uh, infection. And if you had, for example, vaccines or prevention or health clinics, that those are also ways. And so the idea is to start to give young people agency around not only the, um, the information that they need about the the health matter, the infectious disease. And so you know, there are opportunities for them to talk and learn um, those things. But it's also to start to think about the agency that comes if you think about it from a structural um, as opposed to sort of a shame and, and, shame and blame place. Um, and so um, the other thing that we use this board for, in not just to play games, but is also to teach young people to design games. And so then they have to learn about the topic because they have to go off and um, do research. This is a game that we're working on um, right now. It's, right, it's currently being tested in um, three Chicago public schools. Um, and it's a game called Bystander. We started thinking about Bystander because of the issue of sexual assault. And um, sexual assault on college campuses were, were getting a lot of attention. But there's a lot less work being done in high schools. And when we talked to experts and people who were working on college campus and um, in uh, Title IX offices, what they said was, you know, we feel like this is kind of late. By the time you're in college, that we're suddenly talking, and this was actually before the university had started doing training at the level they ha they're, they're doing it now. Um, they're like, this is really late. And so even though there are recommendations, and we're just writing something up about this right now, there are recommendations around Title IX training, even at younger ages. It's just not being done. So how do we start to create a way in which young people can engage in this issue, 
um, in a way, again, that doesn't make them, um, that's age appropriate. And then what we do um, in, uh, in our work in CI3 is always thinking about how we work in kind of in a pro-social way, in a way that is um, asset-based and, and positive for young people. And so we um, came up with the idea of a bystander intervention. And this is really the idea of how do we have the community, how do we create a community-based response, and how do we shift social norms in a community? Um, one of the challenges is it's not focusing on people who have experienced violence, and it's not focusing on people who have perpetrated. It's all of the people around. And so these came out of issues like the Holocaust and issues of Holocaust deniers. It's been used in violence prevention um, and more recently in sexual assault prevention. And then for us, our, the question was if we could create a digital game that represented some of the evidence-based approaches to, um, to bystander interventions, could this be something that scaled? And so the advantages of bystander interventions is that they discourage just blaming the, blaming the victim. It's your fault that happened. It is our collective community's um, uh, responsibility to prevent. Um, it sort of, we start to model some of the social norms. And then what we heard from many young people and what we heard when we were um, in our initial work with young men around this topic is we're immediately on the defensive couldn't this happen to young men, or couldn't we be part of the solution? And so that's, that was sort of how we ended up with this approach to the intervention. So it has four different scenes. It has sort of four different interactive games. And so um, this is a scene, uh, again, this was one of the questions were, well, what happens to young men? And so this is a young man who has experienced sexual assault. And your job is always to play as the, as the support person for that, um, for that person. And so it allows us to model the behaviors as well as give opportunities for people to interact and, and practice the behaviors. So um, for this one, your job is you, you play, you go to a cutscene, then uh, you, a phone opens up and it's a resource center. And it basically teaches young people to search the internet. First you go and talk to a respected adult, you find uh, various answers and then you plug, that, plug it in but it's really giving you a lot of the background and the statistics and um, information that people need about uh, sexual assault. Um, this is another scene with Gina and Holly, and this has to do with the, um, I, with the um, questions around um, victim blaming and, um, and, uh, and bias. And so the idea is that you play as someone who's, you play as somebody, and your job, you play as the friend who supports someone who has had an experience with a partner or a person that, um, that, uh, that she was in a romantic relationship with. And your job is to, again, address that person. And this is how we disabuse people of rape myths. So right now this is in, um, we're, try, we're working with the YWCA, lots of decision making about um, how to think through, how to have who, how, who should represent this, how, um, you know, do we have teachers um, presenting it? Do we have another support person? And what we decided is with the first time that this is um, actually being used, to have very highly trained people in the classroom with young people working through the modules. They go through it in a digital way and then they step out and then their um, small group work that they also do. And then we'll follow, we did pre-post testing and then we'll follow up at the end of Oh gosh, we're actually almost at the end of the year, so we're actually in schools now doing, um, doing the follow-up. We um, did two schools are the experimental. One school is the control, and it's a delayed control, and so they'll, um, ex they'll actually receive access to um, the, the game and the intervention towards the end of um, uh, this year. <coughs> So this is from a genre called serious games. So um, we use the word game and we, uh, we acknowledge it's not a ha-ha game, but yet um, what we're finding is that even with serious games, you have a lot of the affordances of games. So for example, one um, anecdote that I really like from what they're seeing as they're introducing this in schools is that it gives young people a space to ask questions. They can say, you know, like that person in the game thought, as opposed to like I think, and so they mediate a lot of their comments and their concerns through the game as opposed to um, having to sort of own that themselves. Um, 
teachers have said that they're um, in the halls talking about, um, talking about the project. And then it also um, reveals people um, and, and um, I think our, uh, our decision to have highly trained people in the schools with the young people, um, at least for this first part, was, was very helpful because we were able to see that a, a number of the teachers were very uncomfortable with the topic. And so having somebody else there to basically to kind of buffer those in that, um, that experience and then also to give us feedback about what the needs are and how we support schools as we do this. And this is obviously another scene from the game. Um, just to give you a, another example of the types of um, projects that we're doing in the Game Changer Lab, this is a study by my colleague Brandon Hill, and um, Brandon's work is with a young MSM, um, and uh, this is a project around um, PrEP therapy, so pre-exposure prophylaxis therapy to basically to prevent um, HIV. And as he as he did his research and as he did his background research, um, showing that there's a lot of misconceptions about um, not only how these medications work, and these are very widespread, even from the packet insert, um, the sort of the mechanism of action isn't very clear. And so he used a theory based the information motivation and behavioral skills model. And so this key, this part is really about um, giving really clear, accurate information about the medication, but also to give insight into why daily adherence is so important. One of the challenges with PrEP therapy is that there's daily adherence. Um, and what we know from the uh, birth control, the contraception literature, is that daily adherence, and the literature in general, is that daily adherence with anything is really hard for almost anybody. Um, but for, for this, the risks are so, um, the risks are so high. Um, and so the question is, could, if we actually have a digital intervention where we can explain how this works and then add motivation and create kind of networks, can we change behaviors around um, adherence to um, PrEP therapy? And so, um, again, this was an intervention that was designed with young MSM of color who helped to design uh, the videos, who um, the content and the content of the app, and then um, the Game Changer Lab uh, um, developed all the graphics, and then we're, again, studying it in pre-post testing. So the, um, so Game Changer was doing great, um, and through that we've learned a lot about um, taking behavioral interventions and, um, and moving them into technology, designing with communities, and at the center of all of that is this idea of making things that are user-centered. Um, I think that goes back to that original comment I made about what happened to what happens to us in birth control, which is that we design this method and then we say, yeah, well, yeah, you're going to gain weight and you're going to have bleeding, but yeah, you know, but it's going to prevent pregnancy, right? It works, but do you like it, right? And this idea of trying to think about designing interventions that are both effective but also um, acceptable um, are really important. And um, what's happened in the family planning world is that we've had lots of methods of contraception that have come onto the market and are no longer available because for the, the person's experience using it has, um, has been so negative that um, they're no longer being manufactured. And so this idea of what it means to design something for with the with the end user in mind um, is something that we actually just aren't trained to do. Um, and so um, the design thinking lab was the lab where we decided, you know, let's, let's make that process explicit. Let's bring those skills in. So the main project that um, that team is working on right now is a project we call Mobilizing Adolescent Sexual and Reproductive Health. This is a collaboration with the Comer Mobile Health Unit, the, um, the nurses who run the pediatric uh, mobile health unit. And it really goes back to that original quotation that I showed you, that the transportation, the issues of, for young people of having the autonomy to um, get to a clinic like at the University of Chicago, um, parents having to take time off of work, all of those things are incredible barriers to access to reproductive health care. Um, you know, I used to sit in my own clinic and I would say, oh, you know, this person traveled, you know, two hours from the suburbs, we should really try to get the ultrasound on the exact same day 
And then I'd say, oh, you know, this person, their, their zip code is really close by. They should be able to, to get here. You know, they could come back if they had to. And then I remember one day I was sitting um, in clinic and someone said, oh, so-and-so's on, on their way and they, you know, do you mind if she comes late? And I never mind if people come late. I know it's a, I know it's a struggle. And it took them, a, and they told me what street, they were like on 63rd and something, but it took them still another 45 minutes to get there. And it was because nothing, you know, they had a bus that came up this way, but it didn't cross the midway, so they had to hike all the way across. And then you realize you can live very close by and it can still be a really far distance away. And if you have a car and a person who can take time off of work and bring you there, maybe the hour and a half drive is actually less significant than, um, than what you're traversing, even though you're just uh, a few zip codes away. And so the mobile health unit was really uh, about that, is how if you have a mobile health unit that's already going to schools with the idea that they're there to give school physicals or prevent asthma, trying to prevent the things that keep young people out of school, well, pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections also keep young people out of school, so why not give reproductive health? But this is a design problem because um, it's not just a matter of clinically training somebody. You have to actually think from the second a young person is to leave, walks out of school, what are all the things that they'd actually need if they're going to get reproductive health care on a mobile health unit? There's issues of stigma. There's where do you give the pregnant, where do you go have urine to give a pregnancy test? How do you get the results back? How do you keep confidentiality? Are they actually trained? How many people can you see? What method could they go back and continue their day at school with? And so I think actually in this building, we were right in this building. What we did was we came in and we um, brought in a group of young people. No, we weren't. We were at Logan. Logan. Okay. Um, we taped up the floor. We created a model mobile health unit. And we just kept walking through. We, would, we modeled it and we figured it out. And we figured out a lot of the barriers and what, what issues they needed and what problems we needed to solve for. We did the same thing with nurses. And we're now in the process, they're now already delivering a variety of reproductive health care, um, um, a lot of counseling, and a number of contraceptive methods. And we're continuing to scale that up. And now we're expanding to other mobile health units. You also start to le learn the limitations. Um, so the wonderful thing about the mobile health unit is it's been incredibly popular. Um, mobile health units are rather vulnerable. Um, one of them went under a low-hanging bridge and like, you know, like almost like a can, like a tin can, ripped the top off of their mobile health unit and they were out of commission um, for a few months. And the kids were like, when is a mobile health unit coming? You know, they, they were lining up to see it. It was, and there was a snowball effect. Just now they suddenly, they could tell their friends, like, you can get contraception on the mobile health unit. So it's been really important in these schools. But we also know there are limitations. So again, it's a design issue of what happens during the summer. If you have, um, what if you started your medication, if you're getting something that you get every three months and you started it in uh, April, you're gonna end up in the middle of the summer when you need your next injection. And so how do we, from a user perspective, get them moving around? Um, this has been exciting and um, people are now approaching us that they wanna do citywide work. But really the idea is not just how do we make sure when you come to the setting that you know has what you need, right? How do you actually go to the place where it's most convenient for you to get what you need? And so, for example, that would be, um, you know, it's the same as trying to put like healthy vegetables in the local gas station because that's what you have in your neighborhood. Um, and so, um, this is us. These are the um, three amazing women in the mobile health unit, and this is us training them um, to provide contraceptive methods. Um, this is, uh, the flip side of this is we're also doing a larger mapping and um, key informant uh, interviews and community interviews in the, in the community of Englewood. And that's a place where you see very high rates of sexually transmitted infection, very high rates of teen pregnancy overlapping. You could overlap other systems, violence, other, other factors. Um, and the question is, why, right, is it that is it a supply issue? Is it a demand issue? How do young people actually use the available resources? And are those available resources sufficient? Um, and, it's, and again, it's this idea of not just, this is the clinic I have, and I'm going to make sure my clinic um, here at the University of Chicago, which is on the south side, shouldn't that be sufficient? 
obviously something is not sufficient. And so this is, again, walking through and working with the community to understand what their needs are. And then this summer, we'll create a, we'll create a series of um, design sprints trying to think about how do we start to redesign the health care for young people in these communities. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are schools in, um, so you were saying there's a high rate of STD in teen pregnancies in Inglewood. Are schools open and that neighborhood open to um, teaching more comprehensive sex education and um, providing contraceptions as well available for the high school? Yeah, so, you know, um, does not have any school-based health centers. So Chicago, you, Illinois has been pretty good with school-based health centers. Some of them have limits. Um, some of my colleagues have done some work in making sure that the school-based health centers that do exist, or they've done some pilots, to make sure that they have more methods. The Chicago Department of Public Health is working um, really hard in um, both surveying and providing more education. And the Centers for Disease Control did a very large project project um, as part of the Office of Adolescent Health Studies, and Chicago public schools were a site. Um, but a lot, and then there, there are groups, um, there are some groups that have kind of been in and out and have some um, sexual health information. It seems to be patchwork. Um, uh, Planned Parenthood right now, um, supported by Chicago Department of Public Health, is doing very systematic um, STD screening in a number of schools. Harper High is on um, their list of schools. Um, so there are definitely initiatives, but not as much comprehensive, but the schools themselves have not been a barrier. They've actually been pretty enthusiastic about all of this. Yeah. With the declining enrollment, is that causing problems for these school clinics to sort of make, do they need a certain minimum scale to yeah. justify the investment? I haven't, I, so the declining enrollment is a really, um, is a really interesting part of this, but it doesn't seem to be a barrier to um, being able to go and saying that you have enough need. Thanks. Yeah. So as you were thinking about this um, great outreach to the various communities, how did you think about it? Sounds like, how did you engage the young people in the design lab? How did you decide to go to Inglewood yeah. uh, or an yeah. immediate University of Chicago neighborhood? Yeah, so you know we have a lot of projects, and we're in lots of different uh, neighborhoods. The, for this particular one, um, we we looked at two things. We looked at Healthy Chicago 2.0, and we looked at kind of the neighborhoods that were key, and we also looked at the root of the mobile health unit, so that a place where we knew the mobile health unit was either already there or we could expand and reach more schools. Um, so we knew that we had one intervention already in that community. Then we also were looking at where need was and then also where relationships were. Yeah. So it's just this kind of combination. Yeah. I don't know if you want to take this question. Yeah, but, um, uh, how, uh, do you also have a model for thinking about, if it, if it is successful, which I presume it already is, um, financial sustainability? So who's paying for the mobile yeah. health clinic? Is it connected mm -hmm. to the Department of Public Health? Or yeah. how, where does the funding stream? So the mobile health unit is already running, um, and that will continue. So that's um, funded out of Comer. The other one, we're now working with Norwegian. So these are usually hospital-based. Um, but then um, we have a policy person, uh, Lee Hasselbacker, who you know, um, who where we're looking at what would it look like to bill on the mobile health unit. Currently, it's all um, they're kind of it's all kind of philanthropy, the hospital. But with, um, but there's a waiver. Medicaid has a waiver for contraception, and so you don't have to be part of a medical home to be able to bill. Um, we've a lot of this has been worked out for the school-based health centers, and so it's kind of trying to get that similar status for um, the mobile health unit. Um, so a lot of this is kind of being, uh, you know, we we're doing a lot of this work in coalition with the Chicago Department of Public Health, the Illinois Department of Health, Ever Thrive, a lot of community organizations. Um, and so there's, so we, we're kind of in these larger uh, citywide conversations at the same time, moving in these interventions. But I think that's a key to sustainability. I think it's a policy um, component, even though you know, birth control is relatively cheap. Um, and then uh, we just got the next planons were just, uh, were just donated. So we have the implants were donated. Um, so I think there's a lot that we could do, even if we didn't have funding, but I think the sustainability is the key. The other thing that um, we have some larger conversations is the transferring of records 
And so one of the things that happens to young people is they just get siloed. They get care in one place, but nobody ever knows about it. And so there's probably, um, there's some work that's already going on kind of thinking about health portals and things like that. Um, so that's the other piece um, that I think is, it's not so much financial sustainability, but um, you know, they're going to a Planned Parenthood, then they're going to a university, then they're going to, and the records are just not coherent. And that should be solvable now with the EMRs, you know, do their HIPAA issues. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, one other question. Yeah. Um, have, has there been research about um, what form of contraception is most effective with like, teens or young teens? Sure. So um, there's uh, a whole lot of work has gone in nationally to say that the long-acting methods, the implant and the IUDs, are safe in adolescents and could be first line in adolescents. So effectiveness is really clear. It doesn't change um, based on your age. There's a lot of difference in preference. Um, and there's also a lot, of, um, there's a lot of research around, I shouldn't say a lot of research, but there are a lot of um, concerns. And so, so there's sort of efficacy, and then there's what people want. Um, and so. Um, I was thinking more in terms of like what people will use. Will use. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, birth control pills are the most uh, the most popular among anyone. Yeah. Do you engage parents at all, or is there any like working with minors any requirement that you get parental consent? Yes. Yeah. Not for sexually transmitted infection or contraception. Um, however, um, you know the goal is when you when you're doing kind of these bigger implementation projects is not to have them blow up in your face because of the politics. And so, um, because we were working with CDPH, they did send a letter out to everyone saying, you know, we're increasing these services. If there's anything that you, any feedback or concerns you have, please let us know. Um, but parents do sign. So you have to get consent to just get health care on the mobile health unit, like if you're just going to get asthma care, but not if you're getting reproductive health care. So again, this is kind of a design issue because theoretically, you could have a mobile health unit that just did sexual and reproductive health care, which is how Norwegian wants to do it. However, um, you wouldn't have to get any parental consent, but is there stigma associated with that? So that's where this kind of piece of research and design um, works well together. Great. Um, the last lab, and, I, um, and since the project I'll tell you a little more about um, deals with it, I won't go that into it, but is work we're doing on narrative and storytelling. Um, uh, Alita Burris works on this uh, project uh, with me, as well as Patrick Chagoda. Um, the three of us are the PIs for this, uh, for this body of work. Um, and um, the project that uh, Alita and I did was this project called Southside Stories, and this is how we got kind of deeply into narrative and starting to make digital stories uh, with adolescents. And so we're, um, there's a lot, like stories are so deep and so old, and so there's so much that we're, we're figuring out about it. Um, but I'll take you into uh, a project a little more thoroughly um, to do with stories and not stop too long here. Um, so uh, to your point, Colleen, um, a lot of what we do has um, policy implications as well as research implications. So as well as a research team, we have a policy um, person, uh, soon to be a team, we're adding another person. Um, but the idea is how do we um, take what we're learning in the clinical setting, what we're learning in our research, and translate that into sustainable policies. Our priorities are really coming from the experiences of young people and the, the issues that we identify either in our clinical work. Um, we work a lot with, um, you sort of are like a plant, like you know, explaining like, that we work with, our, with, our, uh, with advocacy organizations and a lot of community organizations and really trying to think about how um, what we're designing with games what, and um, these other interventions, what ideas bubble up. Um, so a lot of our work has been around the um, ACA um, um, projects around where are the gaps, how if you actually take a policy and you implement it, what are people's everyday experiences of it. And so um, a, one was a thorough analysis of all the things that, all the contraceptive methods people actually couldn't get with the ACA. Um, and then creating that and then working with an advocacy organization to talk to insurers about what it would look like and then actually passing legislation um, to um, ensure access to all methods of contraception in, uh, in the state of Illinois in that past, oh, I forget exactly, but it was last year. Um, and a lot of the ideas and the ways that we work on policy issues come from things like holding summits, 
having collaborations or working in collaborative meetings to say, you know, what are the things that you all are, um, are, dealing, um, are dealing with and how can we now put research and, um, and uh, policy together with the problems that you're trying to solve. And just like a really simple example, when we started doing this work, we went, uh, I went and met with many, many community organizations, advocacy organizations, and they just talked about the tr how hard it is to get research evidence. If they read something in the New York Times and it says it comes from a paper, they, you can't get a paper. You have to actually pay a significant amount of money to get the access that we do to um, our library. So having a policy program that takes the literature and distills it and on topics that people care about is actually has ended up to be being a, a really important contribution. Okay. So I want to um, take a little time to dive deeper into a project that we're doing right now, not in Chicago, but in India. And the reason I'll, I'll show you this is it kind of brings together a lot of the methodologies that we're using. Um, I, I will show you some of the data that's it's still a project that's ongoing. Um, and I always take the liberty of just saying, you know, because we, um, a lot of what we're doing is working through technology um, and doing things that are user-centered, we show things all the time. You know, I, I'm always showing unfinished, partly, um, partly finished work, um, but because it's that interactive part that's really important. So the questions that you're asking, the things, when we take things and we show them to different audiences, um, that's, that's really important. Um, but we work through a lot of prototypes and um, things that people can actually see because it gives them something to respond to. Um, so Kisakahani is a project um, that um, we are, uh, we're doing right now um, in Lucknow, uh, India, um, Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh. It's sort of, the, an, um, sort of one of the largest, it's actually the largest state in um, India. People, if it was its own country, it would be the fifth largest country in the world. So it just gives you a sense of the population density. Um, the, um, the reason we um, initially uh, were asked to focus there is um, it's funded by the Gates Foundation and it, it's an area that they've really identified as having an unmet need for family planning. But family planning and need for family planning is, to, is, um, is defined based on the need among married couples for family planning. And it is very easy to talk about issues of planning a family if you're in a married couple. With younger adolescents and unmarried adolescents, it's almost impossible to talk about these issues. And so um, in many ways, you need to talk about the antecedents to um, family planning. Um, you need to talk about um, larger questions about just what is the role of adolescents and adolescent girls in, um, in societies. The other, so in many ways, it was as important for us to talk about the, about issues of gender and other forms and other uh, reasons for in inequality rather than just to specifically focus on what this larger frame and larger interest of, um, of the foundation was. And so, but these were the statistics that um, sort of opened up the, the reason and, and why they decided to work in these areas. Um, but these very high rates of, um, of unintended pregnancy and unmet need. So as I said, we're sort of saying that's great, but that's really, um, that's really downstream from where we need to be upstream. We need to start to think about, do we even have the research methodologies to have conversations with adolescent uh, girls? And, um, and this has been a really interesting part of this, just to be working in two different countries and sort of to look at methodologies and see kind of what, um, when, we have a, when we use a similar method in the US, how, uh, what the data look like versus um, in India, how open are people to responding, what types of responses do they get? Um, but the, uh, the basic idea was to start to understand not only the individual decision making um, and individual behaviors, but also the home, the neighborhood, and sort of getting, and basically a socio-ecologic model. And, um, and this should also sit really well um, also in this space, because um, I know that a, a number of you and a number of um, the research networks that you're forming within SSA are really thinking about the socio-ecology of, um, of communities. So, um, 
We use a lot of different uh, research methodologies. So some that are very familiar, baseline surveys, others were uh, life course interviews. Um, but we also used our different labs to start to develop um, methodologies to try and elicit um, some of the questions and um, ideas that we were trying to, to explore. Um, we have um, a great partner. Um, one of the things we do in CI3 is we choose very unusual partners. So our partner there is somebody that actually specializes in TB eradication, but they're amazing at implementation and scaling. And um, given the, the population density of India, you've got you to gotta scale. Like if you're not reaching millions, you didn't do anything. And so you, know, you really have to have somebody who has the technical expertise to be able to do that. Um, and so, and that's one of the challenges that we try to take on with CI3. How do you go from this very intimate, personal level? How do you think about tailoring things, but then how do you think about scaling? So, you know, again, just things that um, are aspirational and that we grapple with. But um, so that's one thing is our is that partner, and we have um, you know we have a great group um, on the ground, and then um, uh, our project coordinator um, graduated actually from the undergraduate. Of few years ago, she's incredibly um, intrepid and just kind of makes all of this work. Um, and so the idea behind uh, Kitsikahani was really to use these different methodologies um, based on our work in narrative and design to try and understand um, the lives of young people. Um, we used uh, life course interviews to try to really understand what are the critical events um, and conducted 123 qualitative interviews with um, boys and girls uh, between 15 and 24. Um, and, um, and, through, um, and through this, we were able to identify a number of gender and SRH-related themes. Um, and so for many of these girls, they said that until they um, reached uh, puberty, until they uh, reached minarchy, that they actually had a relative amount of freedom. And especially for those who had um, siblings, they said, you know, a lot of the treatment was, was fairly similar. And then as they defined themselves, as they, as they basically uh, went through puberty, they were sort of sequestered into, they had to go into the kitchen, they were often segregated, their, um, their ability to do anything was, was significantly changed. Um, the issues of street harassment um, were, were huge throughout the study. Um, that's, um, that's even, that's getting a, uh, that both street and online harassment obviously has been getting a lot of uh, attention here in the U.S. Um, street harassment in India and Lucknow was actually featured in some of the recent articles in the New York Times about online harassment. Um, and then a real sense of not having safety and not feeling safe as they move around, and then a lot of violence within um, their families. Um, the life course interviews were really, um, it, they were hard. Um, these were not young people who are used to having people ask open-ended questions about their lives, and so they often answered with very, very concrete um, approaches. And so one of the things that we did, we've been, um, uh, we've been developing a game here in the U.S., um, and we've had many, many iterations. We're using it in lots of different settings, but it's um, a narrative-based card game. And I'm, I'm like, Ashlyn always laughs at me because I'm constantly amazed at how much fun kids find it. You know, I'm just like, it's just a card game. But, um, <laughs> but they, um, but they, they, she's like, yep, they really like it. They do. Um, so they really like it. And so um, we started to ask, so I have, I, of course, was like, well, could we use the narrative-based card game as a way to do data collection? Um, and we had been um, playing with it, and so we brought that one to India. And what you do is um, you create a context, and then you create characters, and then it's a storytelling. And it goes back to sort of, I, I think, the, what we were finding in Bystander. When you're not like in someone's life and asking them a personal thing, but basically giving them a tool to tell a story, and it's a little more removed, it's less threatening. Um, and so what we say is this is where we finally started to hear, hear about their lives. You heard about kind of the downtime and the context. And this is where we started to hear about their relationships and how they're interacting with one another. Um, and so it was really based on sort of this version of this game that we called Hearsay that we developed in the U.S. And then we kind of created this scenario-based um, game um, for India. And, um, and, you know, it was, you know, we would... Uh, 
like I went over and I kind of taught the I taught the um, our team how to play it, and then they'd go and then they'd try it in the field, and then they'd say, no, 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 it's not working. Then Ashlyn would get on the phone with them, and then we'd adjust the game. So a lot of kind of iteratively trying it out as we played. But what eventually what we saw is this is where um, that it actually worked uh, quite well. So these are sort of the themes that came out of the character game. Um, this is really where we started to see sort of the day-to-day -day interactions between boys and girls. Um, a lot of threatening over social media, this idea of, and the way that it would work is that um, you, it's almost like blackmailing. I will put a photo of you, fully clad, nothing, you know, but I will put a photo of you on social media, and this will tell your family what you do, and this is somehow, um, it, this is a way of shaming you publicly about the type of person you are. And you can kind of see how this relates to girls' families saying, you know, once you reach puberty, then there are all these opportunities for you to be sexual and for you somehow to bring shame on our, on our family. And so this is where um, this sort of public and using this online space to do that. Um, the street harassment was this other piece, but this was also where we started to hear from young men that, you know, even though they participate or you know they watch it, that they actually do have negative uh, negative views about it. But again, you needed to create almost this game-like space where they um, could start to express these views that were actually kind of went against uh, gender roles and gender norms. Um, this is um, a, a um, just a how uh, an example of how we use the baseline surveys. Um, this just gives you people's assessment of how far they could move, like how their mobility in, um, in their environment. So we asked them, if you were to go to the market, um, male, female, so if you were to go to the market, could you go alone, only with someone, or not at all? So um, this is the number of, um, of uh, young women who said that they could go alone. This is the young, number of young men who could go to the market alone. Um, to a health facility, again, um, young men who could go alone, a young woman could go if she went with somebody, and then people who couldn't go at all, and then places outside of your community. So again, this idea of it's not um, that sort of the role of street harassment and how much it restricts um, the movement and mobility of young people. The other way that we portrayed this was through digital stories, um, and these will slowly be posted on our website, but um, a lot of the stories were about this very issue of just inability to move, what it feels like to be harassed on the street, how, yeah? I just wanted to ask, uh, who is your target uh, sample? Like, you, have you been targeted to the school-going uh, children, rural, urban, slums? So this is all urban. So these are all young people from Lucknow who live in or nearby urban slums, whether they're in school or out of school. Out of school too? That means those will be household surveys then, if they're um, out of school? So all of our work was done outside of the school setting, and so most of the young people were in school, but there could have been some kids who were out of yeah, school. Yeah, because why I'm saying, like, there can be huge variation if you go to the rural areas, Absolutely. or if you can go Absolutely. to the children who are out of school. Yeah. A, girl going, a, school a girl going to the school will certainly have a different uh, you know, responses than yeah. what you have got here, kind of. So I was just wondering, have you? Like, yeah, this is predominantly and in. Even okay. if you have an interview at the in the household, the responses will vary a lot because parents will be around and yeah. the response yeah. will vary. Yeah. So these are mainly young people who are who have who go to school. These were not done in school, and everyone was interviewed separately from their family. Yeah. Um, and these are um, these are young people who live in Lucknow. Um, and there is some, I mean, I, your point is the people are so varied, um, so um, absolutely there's incredible diversity, but there's also, I think, one of the other pieces, is these are young people who we recruited through various organizations, so they also have some attachment to, they not, may not be active participants in those organizations, but they at least have some attachment through their networks to um, various community-based organizations. Um, and then the, um, 
the last, uh, the last thing I'll tell you about, I think it's last, is um, what we call body mapping. Um, and so body mapping is, um, oh, I'm sorry, story circles, sorry. I was like, I don't think we're at the last one. I think we're in story circles. Uh, so story circles is a, are a narrative-based uh, methodology, um, not quite like a focus group. Um, the idea, instead of having a moderator asking questions, it's people telling um, stories around, around a prompt. Um, and the idea is there's something, there's sort of this magic of a circle and something magic about this uh, telling, telling stories in a circle. And it's a methodology that we use a lot in our work is sort of sitting and training people to tell um, stories. Um, and what we did for this is with all of this work, we're always doing train the trainers. We're always working with um, experts in the local community that may be experts in our area or may have, so they might have a background in storytelling and then we tr uh, train them in story, stories as a research methodology. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of exchanges and cultural exchanges. Um, and then we um, prompt stories and we get a variety of stories. Um, and so in, um, in the story circles, what um, I think the, what happens with this is that when one person sort of, and we call it almost like bravery, right? When someone takes a risk with a story, it almost gives permission for the next person to take a risk with a story. Um, sometimes you run the risk of people telling similar stories, but the idea is that um, <coughs> you, um, unlike a focus group where one person can dominate, each person gets a chance to tell their story, but there's also kind of a feeding off of, of one another's for their story. So some methodologic implications that we're working through but also some opportunities. Um, and this is really where um, we, we ask them, you know, what's a time in your life when you faced a difficulty and overcame it? And then also ask them specific questions about gender. Um, this is really where stories about the importance of education in their lives came out. Um, this is, again, uh, how rigid the gender norms were but also how um, many of the young people, both um, young, both uh, girls and boys actually wanted to reject gender norms. Um, and so then the last thing was, um, what is body mapping. And body mapping comes out of a therapeutic tradition, um, but again, here um, it's kind of emerging as a research methodology. Um, these sessions were about three hours long. Again, we had trained people to help work through them. We're also doing a lot of cross-cultural uh, uh, work, but also um, a lot of overcoming a lot of language uh, barriers. Um, and so the idea with body mapping is that you lie down and you draw a figure, and then you start to um, you narrate. So it would be um, one person lies down and another person traces them, and then you take your own figure. And then you say, well, think back to your childhood and remember what that was like. Remember the people who are around you. What are the symbols that represent your life? Draw those on the map. Think about your family. Think about the people around you. What are the symbols? And so you start to have them narrate their um, lives, but through drawing. And you can do other things. You can do magazines. You can do other pieces. And, um, and so, um, you know, again, this is where we saw how important adolescence was for girls. It was a turning point, actually a pretty negative uh, turning point. Um, the role of schools as a, a safe space for young people and um, uh, for young people of all genders. When you um, looked at the body maps for girls, it was often a lot was just like household chores. Like everybody it gets many more chores with uh, adolescents, but the girls are household. They're like really relegated to their homes. The young men, it's about going to the store, being the one who has the freedom to leave the house, but also having all the chores that um, you require because you're leaving the house. Um, and that um, even if internally in your family, things are a little more egalitarian, when you go out into the community, those gender norms get reinforced. Um, and then how absolutely taboo um, relationships were. And so these are pictures of um, the body uh, mapping sessions and what those look like in um, different individuals' drawings. Yeah. I'm just curious, did you um, encounter other gender expressions? Or I'm not sure if it's yeah. like a binary, like, like, yeah. like you see it tend to play out here. But I'm just kind of curious about that. So those actually came out a lot in, I shouldn't say a lot. When they came out, um, often, um, 
in the storytelling sessions. And I think, um, so one thing that I'm not showing you is um, we also created digital stories. Um, and I think the reason that um, those became, uh, that became a place was that um, because we did, we spent a full day working through different methods with the same group of people and I think eventually a lot of the, um, I think the, some of the social barriers broke down a bit. Um, and so, but that, was, um, but that was a really important part is that if you wanted to just in any way defy uh, any, the binary, society pushed you back. And so there are a couple of stories. One um, about, um, there are a number of, and the majority of stories were about young men not being masculine enough for their society. And that happened a lot. So um, whether it was size, whether it was like your, um, when you're a child, you could play with anyone you wanted. You could play with girls. You could play with um, things that were kind of defined as typically uh, feminine um, objects, and that as you grew, you were absolutely prevented from doing that. So those were those were the stories. But again, it, I think those mainly had to come out in stories. Very hard to get at those in life course interviews. And we used a lot of the same methods. So like you, any but everybody had to answer a survey, and so we weren't finding it in those sort of much more. Um, uh, survey type items. Yeah. Um, so this is um, adolescence as a turning point. Again, this is this idea. A lot of these images were um, for girls were around the household. Um, so for the girls, it really limited their freedom. Um, for boys, many uh, greater pressures um, and this sort of idea of household um, items. Um, this is um, images around school and how much, how safe they felt and how happy they felt uh, when they were in school. Um, they said, you know, in my family, elder people scold me um, that don't go there, um, and they tell you not to talk to that person. There's nothing like that in school. We all live together in school. Boys and girls all play together. There's nothing like that. We have to play only with girls or not with boys. Um, and. Um, but the um, issues of body image came up a lot. Um, and so there's a lot of socialization around issues of weight, issues of skin tone, um, and issues of gender. And so um, a lot around uh, weight. Um, so um, this one said, there are people from my community that make fun of my size because I'm fat as compared to other girls. But my mother says, daughter, that, it, that I'm very good looking. But the people around me say that you're fat. You should." eat this and you should not eat that, but I just ignore them. Um, and then um, another girl who says um, her color is very dark and they tell their children then you should not be with her. People just like to have uh, friendships with fair colored uh, people. Um, and this was something that we heard also from young men that you know, they were ostracized and, and, not, um, and uh, not valued. Yeah. I heard that last slide that you put up could have been a transcript of, of a louder than a bomb mm. session in Chicago. I mean, that that, that is exactly that sounds exactly like what the people, the young poets, say in those louder than a bomb contests. Yeah. Every single thing that you had up there was I heard in yeah. like the semifinals or whatever over at the uh, Yeah. I was curious with the body mapping if you um, heard trauma narratives come out and how that was addressed and managed in those in those groups. Yeah. Groups. Yeah. So um, trauma is a huge theme in all of this. Um, it comes out in um, a lot in our in the we in the digital storytelling workshops, um, and the the trauma is um, you know some of the the stories around um, you know a young man told, tells a story about um, a, uh, his sister not having enough dowry and um, and basically being set on fire and dying from it. I mean, so the this, this stories are in, incredible. And um, whenever, we, whenever we talk about it, even in, whether it's in the US or in India, these are, um, these are stories. I was um, talking to a group of young people, and someone said, that happened to somebody in my family. So these stories are really raw. They're really present. Um, and um, so there's a lot, and that's an extreme, but it's uh, there's a fair amount of it, and um, and this the street harassment is felt as trauma, um, and there so we have stories about just um, 
the people's experiences with you know trying to go on a bus and what happened and 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 you know basically not going to school any longer. Um, so um, we did a lot of, uh, it's one of the reasons we work through community organizations so that we have the networks into existing resources. Um, but, and this is something that also surfaces in our work in the US is just, um, and, and one of the reasons I'm so um, happy that I'm connected to the clinic and to SSA <laughs> because we, we really do need um, a lot of people around to support the work. Um, and yes, the, universe, the universal way in which people exert power over one another, over physical features is, yeah. Um, so um, as I said, um, we're, uh, at CA3 we think about how to make things and how to make um, young people and communities part of the intervention. So um, once our narrative team uh, left, we, our design team went out um, and we created a workshop where we actually trained um, uh, young people in design thinking. This is a, a primer that we uh, made, kind of showing in, in Hindi, um, showing them the processes of how do you, of, of um, framing a problem to make it solvable, right? Um, I think many of us can describe problems, but it's hard to figure out where do you get a toehold to start to address a problem. Um, and so this is, um, these are the workshops that we're running, teaching them how to brainstorm and coming up with multiple ideas going out into their communities, conducting interviews, understanding and, and exploring um, their ideas, and then coming up with multiple um, solutions and evaluating um, how good those solutions are, and then making prototypes to test them. And then um, my colleague, I work with um, somebody at the Harris School um, on this project, we went out and they pitched their, their various ideas, some that were quite impossible, um, and some that were uh, some that were awesome. Um, those are now um, we now have um, young people are working with various NGOs um, that are helping them uh, shape their ideas and study them and implement them and, uh, and evaluate them. We also independently funded a series of NGOs to do small grants um, to um, address some of the themes that we discovered in uh, in the research. The idea being. You all are experts in your, um, in your environment. We are not. Um, and how, what are the things that you'd like to try to propose? Yeah. Do you see any um, like longitudinal work coming out of this or like yeah. continuing to follow their um, progress and the work they're doing? Yeah, so these, um, the small grants will be are, run, are being run over a six month period. Um, but then um, our follow-on work is actually, will be a planning grant where we're it, we'll uh, start to look at the interventions that were designed mm -hmm. um, and start, and then identify uh, community partners and scaling partners and then start to say which things of these, you know, which are, are ready for, to be road tested. So we'll see, it's, um, it's gonna be kind of one of these big leaps from pilot to uh, larger, but. Um, but again, that's why we partner with um, Operation Asha, who's, man who's like basically managing to do incredible work scaling. Um, so we've gone from like working with these really small NGOs that are on the ground to, I, um, and we've had like kind of this surrounding partner of, uh, we've been partnering with the big NGOs, but all of our work has been very community based. But now the idea is how do we go to the ones that have already been working at a national level to partner with us as we, as we move these interventions forward. Um, one of the things that we did early on, though, in this effort to kind of scale and sort of think that comes next is we did create another, a number of digital stories. Um, and those we ended up partnering with um, uh, this group called uh, Chin, and they run this thing called the International uh, Film Festival. And so a number of the digital stories that we created in the film festival ended up going with Chin Media. And they got shown all over India, so these are um, the kids uh, looking at our digital stories. Um, and then they actually rated them. That's the, and it was like, that story is very good, very moving. We didn't like the music. You know, they're very, very critical. Um, and then it came back to Delhi for the jury. And these are, um, the jury session is young people from all over the world. They're flown into Delhi and they decide. Um, and we were able to use our Delhi Center as one of the venues for the, um, for the film festival. So we were able to partner with uh, Chin, Chin uh, Media. And Pinky, 
uh, one of our um, one of our filmmakers um, won um, won a special award, and so that was uh, that was one of the high points of uh, Kissika Honey. I have uh, just five minutes, and I'll finish the. I'll save that for questions. But um, what I did want to just say is that um, in July I took a role. Um, I was just asked to mention this. Um, I took a role as um, the vice provost for uh, diversity and faculty development. It has a different title, but um, as you know, I pick bad titles. So, but this is what it does. <laughs> um, and. Um, and I actually, uh, you know, it, it might just be because I can't keep too many, you know, maybe I can't keep enough new ideas in my brain, but um, there are so many things that um, we do at CI3 that I think are really relevant for the way that we'll work in diversity here. Um, the, first, um, the first forums or the first um, discussions about kind of the university-wide plans for diversity start next week, and so that email will go out um, hopefully today, hopefully tomorrow. Um, to announce, um, announce a session, so I invite you to come. But I think there are some, uh, some true parallels, which is that you know, each of us in our units are experts on the climate issues, the diversity issues that we're experiencing, but sometimes it's, um, we need to be seated with ideas, we need to be, have, um, be seated with funding, um, with, and also opportunities for collaboration. And so um, that's, I think, the role of the provost's office. If you go back to that map, it's really like, who's here? And how do we reconfigure ourselves in different ways to solve problems? So one thing that we're doing is really starting to map resources. Um, if, this, if you're doing a conference here and here and here and here, are, are there places that we can start to come together? If we're all struggling with similar issues, how do we start to come together to start to address those issues? Um, a real emphasis on um, local leadership and helping people get the resources they need, but also to start to share ideas and get the support um, across units. Um, so there's a lot more about how we're thinking about um, diversity, but a lot of it is really um, focused on how do we create a more inclusive environment. And one of the things that makes it important to talk about this at SSA is that um, I think probably what you'll find, similar to what I found in the medical center, is that um, when you're really engaged with other people and the lives of other people, um, disparities, we have a very strong sense of disparities and what that means. That's not a language that the whole university um, uses, the language around equity and disparities, and it's just, it's just not a language. And so when I came out and started sort of using those terms, people looked at me like, hmm. So we do, so I think that um, points to places like SSA as a role for leadership. Um, not only have you all already started to do a lot of work in the diversity and inclusion space, but I think once you start to understand some of the issues that the camp, campus wide that um, people are struggling with, there's a, a real role for leadership. The other reason why I think SSA has an important role is that um, there, um, we're, as the university is, is um, Basically, we have the, some of the needs that students are experiencing, whether it's around issues of health or mental health, um, and the most recently food scarcity is, um, is a true issue on this campus. There are things that we who work in a clinical and an administrative way actually have to um, teach the rest of uh, and could contribute to the rest of the institution. So to be continued, but just to let you know what that's about. So I think we have like two minutes for questions. <laughs> but you all had questions while we were talking, so um, anything I can answer for you. I, yeah. just, I just wanted to make a plug that I was glad to hear that it's um, Operation Asha that you yeah, partnered yeah. with, because um, at least I know it's a, a woman and a man who run it, but he was a Harris grad and a GFAP um, grad. So Ooh. he comes from the University of Chicago, yeah. is my point. Ooh. And uh, yeah. he, he does do fantastic work. <laughs> Yeah, so um, that's, you know, it's again kind of another great lesson is, you know, you kind of, you, you need to form these great community partnerships. And so we do, in CI, at CI3, we do everything through partnership. Um, but sometimes um, you partner not around a 
we both believe in the same thing, but you partner around like complementary skill sets. Um, and so Sandeep was, uh, Ahuja was, um, he did a master's here at the Harris School and he just, he's just been an amazing uh, translator, implementer, and then because the laws and policies in India are so complicated and they're, um, and they're getting more complicated with some of their concerns about money flowing into India, um, having somebody who could help us navigate all of that has been incredible, yeah. yeah. Energy Fab grad. Energy Fab grad. Thank you all so much for your uh, thank you for your time.